Welcome to another chapter of The Crown Podcast. Today we have a very special guest. I know I say it every single time, but I just know some amazing people and I'm not afraid to say that every single time that we have a special guest. And today our guest Maribel Sintron is a powerful leader, someone who has inspired me for over a decade, um, has been a guiding light, has been a great role model, um, has been consistent. And her, alongside her husband, they have a ministry that empowers people to transform their lives um, in a way that really highlights that you are not what you are going through. And the chapter that you are on currently doesn't have to define the rest of your life. Her works are global. She has a large, large following. She is best known for her unique and incredible social media handle, Broken to Peace, P-E-A-C-E. Um, and her, her mission overall, it transcends all the barriers and these labels that we have within, within society. She reaches out to all people, all ethnicities. She is a breath of fresh air on the internet that sometimes can feel very negative and corrupted. Uh, Maribel, it's so great to have you here. Thank you for joining the Crown Podcast. It's a pleasure. I'm excited. I am just in awe with what God is doing. And I'm just excited for the people that are going to tune in and hear our voice. I believe this is going to be a breakthrough for many. And I think that this is going to be an on-time podcast for an audience that needs what we're going to bring to the table. So I'm excited. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to have you. And, you know, we're going to get straight into it. Um, today's topic is the healing power of forgiveness. And, you know, I personally haven't found forgiveness to be a difficult thing. You know, I since I, I grew up, I, I was always quite okay with you know admitting when I'm wrong um but also accepting other people's apologies but as I got older I realized that this is an anomaly <laughs> and that many many people do struggle with forgiveness and it made me be a lot more compassionate when speaking about it because it's something that can ruin a person's life the lack of forgiveness um, but also it's a very, very heavy weight to carry if one doesn't know how to forgive. And so I just want to start off today speaking about um, maybe some of the concerns with not having a forgiving heart. And just from your perspective, what forgiveness means to you? And can you identify from being in that place where it's difficult to forgive? Well, I think that in order to understand Forgiveness is by giving a definition because um, many people can view forgiveness in different ways. Um, forgi forgiveness can come in many levels, right? Um, you took my candy. I'm sorry. Okay, I forgive you, right? Versus you took my man. Sorry. You see, it's it's there's different levels that come uh, with forgiveness. So I think that in, in order for us to even begin this conversation, we really need to know what forgiveness means. And it may be different for everyone, but just to generalize the term, we know that forgiveness is an intentional decision to let go of resentment or anger. It's an intention intentional decision to let go of resentment or anger. So I'm being intentional when I say I forgive you because I'm choosing to let go of whatever is causing resentment in me or causing anger. And so if I sit here, we'll be all we'll, we'll be on here all, all all evening, right? Talking about my own experiences. Um, but I think it's very, very important to understand what forgiveness means because when we then talk about down the line what unforgiveness looks like, right? we won't really know how to approach forgiveness if we don't know what to unforgive looks like. Does that make sense? 
It does. And, you know, what comes to my mind is um, we've all been wronged, you know, and it doesn't feel nice. And I think sometimes when we're wronged, it feels like we're wronged in private. It feels like we're the only one going through it. And so we want there to be some type of public display of acceptance for the wrong or because it, it angers you. It feels so raw inside. And so we want the perpetrator or the person who has wronged us to admit that they're wrong mm -hmm. or at least acknowledge the pain that they've caused. And if we don't get that, it makes us more angry mm -hmm. and more upset and it starts to really fester and it grows. And the original crime may have been something quite small, mm -hmm. but the gradual holding on to it for a long time, it, it gets bigger and bigger. And every day that passes, passes where the, the other person doesn't acknowledge or justify the pain that you feel it grows and grows into this monster and mm -hmm. so it had me thinking that um one of the difficulties with forgiveness is that we want we want punishment mm -hmm. so if someone harms us we want them to be harmed or them to feel what we are feeling but the forgiven heart wants correction mm -hmm. so be able to point out what someone's done wrong and how it's harmed you without making them feel guilty, providing an opportunity for them to learn what they've done so they can improve moving forward. That's what forgiveness looks like rather than everything will be even if you go through what I went through or if I make you as miserable as you've made me. And so I just wonder, like, from your perspective, the, the idea of judgment or correction versus punishment you know uh, feeling as though if we are wronged that we are owed something well it depends on how deep um it goes right because typically if it's in the moment of something something happening we may look for that resolution by causing or trying to get that uh, apology or causing harm to kind of find that ends me like you cause me harm I'm going to cause you that that equality in that you hurt me I'm going to hurt you but I I feel in my spirit that your audience um and the people that this message is going to fall upon are people who have rooted pain that comes from childhood that comes from adolescence that comes from being teenagers and on in life the, the, the battles that they have uh, endured, the scars that they have, that they don't know how to manifest forgiveness in their adulthood. And so I think that when something happens in the moment, it's easy to have that mindset that I'm going to do to you what you did to me. It's not that simple when we're dealing with rooted issues that we don't have the perpetrators in front of us to cause that pain too. And so we cause it to all those that come upon our reach. And it can be friendships that come that are new, relationships that come that are new, family members, people pain, right? Pain, they're pain for the things that I've been through. And so this is why I said in the beginning that in order to understand forgiveness, it has to coincide with unforgiveness because we could we cannot truly forgive unless we know what we haven't forgiven. And, you know, it makes me think of, you know, the, the whole cliches that we see on social media, forgive but don't forget and... Mm. You know, and that's one they say. And then another they say is, you know, I I can forgive you, but I don't have to continue to be in your life. And this part is 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 tricky for me because I understand the the message of it. And it doesn't mean the person has to be in your life. However, when we look at the model of forgiveness mm. um, biblically, 77 mm. times seven, it doesn't say 77 times seven, if, or 77 times seven, but it is what it is. You know, forgiveness mm -hmm. means a clean slate. Mm -hmm. 
and um i guess if god himself were to use that same rationale it would be i will <laughs> forgive you but i won't forget what you've done <laughs> Just in case you do it again, I'll hold it mm -hmm. against you, mm -hmm. you know, for my own wisdom. But and so I think it's you're right, it is challenging. And it's not just as easy as saying, okay, I forgive the person. It has to come from the heart. And so you may not be in a place where you feel today that you are ready to let go of that weight. Um, but it has to come from your heart, it has to be intentional and it has to be authentic. You know, it, it's not just words, it's an action, um, it's a verb. And and so there is another layer to this. That's, so that's forgiving someone else. Mm -hmm. The next layer to this is, um, as you spoke about, you know, childhood traumas and um, just trauma as an adult in general, life is tough, you know. And we go through experiences sometimes and as we grow and evolve and we look back, sometimes we find it hard to forgive ourselves for the decisions that we've made. We find it hard to forgive ourselves for who we've had to be in that season of survival. Hmm. Um, is this something you come across within your, your works often? Well, I can definitely speak from experience that um, in 2003, when I came to Christ, I would say I was at my prime or what should have been my prime in life. I was 23. That's the age where, you know, a normal young person is trying to figure life out. They're heading on to the world. They're uh, interacting in a way that they think, right? Or they believe they're adults. Whereas a person like myself, I, at that point in life, when I came to Christ, mm. I was already on the streets since the age of 12. And so there was a lot of scars that came from the age of 12 to, I, to my encounter with the Lord. There was a lot of hurt, betrayal, a lot of things that came with my life that when I came to the Lord, I had a lot of baggage. So yes, I, I can definitely say that uh, I know very well through my experiences. I know very well through, uh, through my own trauma that there's been a lot of areas in my life that when I came to the Lord at the age of 23, that was for me to be justified in my anger and my resentment. That was for me to be have a badge of honor and say, mm -hmm. I have every reason to be who I am and be the way that I am because of how I had to survive mm. in life and the way life treated me. When, when I came to Christ, um, or let me just put it this way, when God came to me, right, because I wasn't looking for him, he, 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 he found me. I encountered him. He found me where I was, um, and I realized that there had to be transformation I allowed him to transform me, except touch the part of my heart. And so I looked like a great Christian. I had the image, right, of the of that, of what a, a person who is trying to change their life would look like, the persona that we put up to show the world that everything is okay. Meanwhile, I didn't want anyone touching the heart because the heart issue is where the anger and the resentment and the unforgiveness lies. So I, I know very well what it is to struggle with the buildup of so, so many reasons why not to forgive and holding on to that as, as a badge of honor, as if I'm if I was gonna use that in a way to protect myself from ever from it happening ever again. And I think a lot of people, uh, I'm, I'm sure, and this is something that you probably come across with dealing with people, is that's why it makes it so difficult to do it for, for individuals who have those types of scars, because it's almost like a justification of, I'm just trying to be more wiser. I'm, I'm trying to um, not repeat what I've been through, right? We, we use those kind of like, I'm trying to avoid myself from falling down that same pit. I'm trying, but in reality, it's kind of excuses that we're putting to protect 
that 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 the reality that we're still harboring right that anger and resentment that doesn't lead us to enter into full forgiveness so yes i can definitely speak just on a personal level from the experience that um that is factual that forgiveness doesn't come so easily when it's worn as a way of saying i've overcome i've over overcome life so i can act in this manner and not necessarily have to let this go because it's my way of protecting me mm. and and then, you know, even with that, if you were to let it go and it happened again, the crime, it's then now another layer of having to forgive yourself for opening up again. Or And this is what happens, you know, with relationships and um, friendships and careers. People who have been betrayed, it takes them years sometimes to build that trust back up. And, and then it happens again. And it's like climbing the hill again. And you know, each time they climb, you know, they, their spirit gets stronger, but they physically may be a bit more, you know, damaged. There may be a bit more scars or hidden bruises, or as the term comes up today, triggers, you know, and, and so, you know, we've, we, you, we've touched on your faith and you said, you know, you're coming to Christ coming to you. Um, the next layer of this is um, God's forgiveness, you know, and, faith and so you've given the definition of what forgiveness means to the everyday person right but what does forgiveness mean to you as a follower of christ so interesting enough um when when i came to the lord um i read it in scripture right sometimes a lot of times we read stuff and it, it it sounds powerful and it's a great message and it's a feel good moment, but if there's no application, it's ineffective. And I would say for the first four to five years of my conversion, um, I tried to apply the fundamentals of the word to follow through with my responsibilities as a Christian. And so I wore it very well, but then I kept attracting the same type of people, even being a Christian that I did in the world inside the church. I kept attracting the same type of um, pain, but with a different name. I kept attracting the same type of um, outcomes. I kept attracting just the same exact replica of what I dealt with in the world. And then I kind of understood a lot of people when they say, you know, this is why I don't go to church right because we see these things inside just as it is outside and for four to five years i remember just seeing this and under and not understanding how can i be following a god who's above all things knows all things and yet i'm being opened to being scarred left and right within the realm of the quote unquote church. And then I came to the realization that my conversion with God was so real that this was not about the people. This was about my own relationship and walk. And so I turned to God and I remember telling him, what am I doing wrong? I'm still allowing the same people that did me wrong in my circle. I surely must have forgiven them. I still, um, you know, have conversations with people that I would not have had in the world because they did this, this, this to me, like you spoke earlier, right? We kind of hold them, we, we kind of try to hold them accountable for what they did to us. But in Christ, I knew that, that that's not supposed to happen. So let me, let me fake the funk, right? And, and have these conversations and allow, I'm doing the right things. But why wasn't it feeling right? Why wasn't it authentic? Why wasn't it genuine? And I remember crying out to God. And he told me, I want you to look in the mirror. And I looked in the mirror and he said, the problem here is you. And that was offensive. What do you mean the problem here is me? <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm doing everything I need to do, you know, to walk this walk. And then he goes, look deeper. And I realized that looking in the mirror, I was looking at 
what everyone sees, right? What everyone sees in their eyes. She looks like a great Christian. She sounds like, like a great Christian. She walks like a great Christian. No one can see the deep parts that the Bible says that the Holy Spirit is the, the searcher of all hearts. He knows your thoughts. He knows what you're feeling. He knows what you're going through. He knows what you're trying to hide. And he knows if you're trying to deceive, not him, but at the end yourself. And so when I looked deep past what I was seeing in the mirror, I realized that I was trying to have control of my life all while saying, God, you're in control. I was trying to control how, I was trying to control who I was by trying to play the role, but not live the role. And so when I was able to understand that the reason why I keep attracting the same things is because I truly did not allow God to transform my heart. He transformed the exterior, but he did not transform my heart. It's when I realized that I truly was not serving him wholeheartedly. And so I was doing like the Pharisees, right? Just doing all the good deeds, but not having that transformative encounter with God. And so when I came to that realization, I just threw it all at his feet. And I realized I no longer want to be a prisoner of my unforgiveness. I no longer want to be a prisoner to what other people did to me. What people did to me does not make who I am. It's just setting me on the course to become who I'm becoming. But they do not define who I am. I was allowing them to define me because that pain was molding me to play a role, but not live it. And so once I allow God to show me me, not who I wanted to see, but show me me is when I was able to allow him in there and do the work that he needed to do. And then that's when I encounter forgiveness. And until we get there, we will say we forgive, but we will continue to fall back and go backwards and always feel like we're taking five steps forward and go 10 steps back. So it's just going to be this vicious cycle. And I feel like that's the bridge because as you said, it looks like forgiveness because, you know, I'm around those people, you know, I still work with them and I still hang out with them. And it's, it's like forgiveness in the mind, isn't it? It's um, mm -hmm. you can convince yourself something if you keep telling yourself that thing over and over again I've forgiven them I've forgiven them I'm not upset anymore I'm not upset anymore look I can hang around them I'm not upset anymore and eventually you can believe your own lie mm -hmm. but the key part that you said and this is where I think the bridge is and that forgiveness goes from being just held within the domain of your mind and your mouth and to any external public viewer <laughs> and it goes to or comes from a place of your heart I think mm. that's the bridge I think that's yes. when you feel the healing power of forgiveness yes. um, you can feel good mentally you know it can give you a quick dopamine rush like hey uh, I've come so far I remember when I couldn't be in the same room as that person and now they're over there but as long as they don't talk to me we're okay Mm -hmm. But the, that heart work, it's almost like you see a new person when you see that person mm -hmm. again, because you you approach them from a place of grace, knowing that you too have wronged in your lifetime. And I think this bridge that we speak about is, I think that's a great way of looking at it, that, you know, extend the same amount of grace that you would expect for your own wrongdoings, extend that to somebody else. And that is the model of Christ. You know, he forgives us no matter what we do without strings attached. It's unconditional. And as a result of that, we have then an opportunity to change our hearts, change our behaviors. And so I want to talk a bit about grace, you know, and what role does that play um, in forgiveness and how important do you think it is for us to be mindful 
throughout our days, in our interactions, in our responses to things, to keep that grace present. It encompasses who Christ is, grace. That's what I think about when I think of Christ. Of Christ. Many other um, things can describe them, but grace. Um, when you have grace, you see differently. You see people differently. You feel towards people differently. You realize that they are human. They have emotion. They have feelings. They have their own story. They have their own been through. They have their own path that many times we don't know about. And by showing that individual grace can even help them, lead them to their breakthrough. Because by extending that grace that God has extended to myself, has extended to you, allows people to see that there's something more than what they're going through. There is a resolution. There is a resolve. There's something greater than the pain or the struggle or whatever it is that they're going through. When they see grace in another person, they naturally gravitate to that because they see that it's something different. It goes beyond what the flesh can understand. It's something so, there's like a, a healing in grace. And I, I think that it's just such, it's so necessary in a time that we live that everyone is just so up in arms and and fear is trying to infiltrate the minds and fear is trying to overtake uh, uh, you know, homes and, 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 and the lives of people. But when grace comes, it abounds. It just comes in a wave that says, wow, you know, that person was able to extend something that I don't feel I was worth receiving. And that just changes the individual to potentially just transform them to want to then pass on the grace to someone else. It's like kind of like that pay it forward type of uh, uh, setup, right? And so I think it's very vital, especially nowadays. I think grace is a beautiful thing and is is very rare to see, unfortunately. Um, but when it's extended, it's just so uh, people gravitate to that because it's just not seen as much as we we should see. Um, but it starts with you, it starts with me, and it starts by just exuberating it at any given time and just knowing that he, before anything, he graced us with his peace, with his love, with his salvation, and he chose us for such a time as this. And so therefore, my desire is to show that same love and that same peace and that same hope to other people who need to know that their life also has a story and they have a story to tell. So, yeah, I think that's very vital, especially in these times. You know, it's right. It's so interesting because as you are speaking and, and I'm listening to you and I'm listening to what I'm saying, and it's almost like I can hear thousands of little voices saying, yeah, but. If I forgive, it's like me saying that it's okay what they did to me. Mm. It's like me pardoning them and they don't deserve it. And, you know, it's not okay. You know, um, they get to go and live their life and be free. But I have to still carry the weight of um, the violation. In that case where it feels like it's a justification for the, the wrong. Um, how are we to view those types of scenarios? So as I had um, started this conversation um, regarding forgiveness, the other side of forgiveness is obviously unforgiveness. Mm. It's a conscious and also an unconscious decision of not relinquishing anger or resentment. And I have to say that because when, and I have to say consciously and unconsciously, because sometimes people believe they've forgiven and they convince, they self, convince, convince themselves that they have, and unconsciously they don't realize that it's still lingering in there, right? Until something kind of just manifests or reminds them and it, it brings them out of character. But I have to define that because... 
there's only two options. You either forgiven or you have not forgiven. There's forgiveness or unforgiveness. And so either you're making an intentional decision to let go of that resentment or anger, or you're consciously or unconsciously holding on to resentment or anger. And so if you're choosing to hold on to that resentment or anger, then what you're saying is what they did to me is greater than my peace. What you're saying is what you did to me is going to carry on with me and it's going to alter the way I live my life because I want them to pay for X or Y, or whatever it is that they did. If not, I'm not going to be at peace. And it's almost like that vengeance, right? That desire to want to just get back. And you don't want to say you forgive because if you forgive, you're giving them that, like you said, that past to just get away with whatever. But the beauty of understanding what forgiveness looks like through Christ is an interchangeable transaction that's going on. Christ says, forgive them as I've forgiven you. Because then in other scriptures, he says, because your enemies are under my feet. I will take care of your enemy. Well, who's your enemy? Anyone who's looking to not see you move forward in life. Anyone who is trying to stop you from your becoming, anyone who intentionally has wanted to do you wrong, is doing wrong, or will continue to do wrong, those are your enemies. And so when we learn that forgiving has a greater release, not necessarily giving them a free pass, but giving God the opportunity, the door to say, okay, now you can sit back and relax. Now I got you. See, when you're trying to take control, and then I go back to my testimony, I was trying to take control of my heart. I gave everything else to God, but I wanted to take control of my heart because I was going to protect it at all costs. And God said, well, then who is in control of your life? Because if you're in control of your life, then I'll just step back and let's see how far you get. And so the I didn't get far at all. I just kept repeating the same patterns in the church that I did in the world. See, it was the same behavior, the same mindset, the same approach, the same responses. But when I gave it all to God, it was no longer my worry what they did, how they did it, when they did it, if it hurt me, if I didn't like it, if it made me cry, if I lost sleep, if I didn't eat, this, that, and the third did not phase me any longer because now I was no longer in control. I made the choice to say, here you go. Lord said, cast all your anxiety, all your fears, cast it to me, meaning cast it and don't pick it up any longer. I gave it to God and I saw him fight. I saw him bring my enemies to me. The Bible says he will bring your enemies and he will put them in peace with you. What does that mean? He will make he will make them realize the wrong that they've done. And they'll come back around and ask you for forgiveness, even without you looking. See, and that's the beauty of God. When we really, truly understand his character and allow him to be the God of our life, is when we can see him move on our behalf where we don't have to worry about vengeance, where we don't have to worry about getting back at them, where we don't have to worry about if they're going to pay for what they did to us. When that doesn't even phase us anymore because we're too busy focused on growing and becoming a better version of us. And so I think that you really have the choice to forgive or continue to not forgive. That's really your choice. No one can make you... Uh, uh, make that decision today. Like you have to forget, right? We can give you the tools and we can let you know that it's on the table. You can choose to allow God to handle all the wrong and allow the peace that comes with that to overtake your heart so that you don't continue to allow this to break you down and take life away from you and take time away from you. Or you can choose to hold on to that poison and hope that the other person dies which is not realistic and that that is it so you said it's a transaction and so 
you know, just in case you're not sold, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> on some of the benefits of forgiveness, the transaction isn't just that God will lighten the load for you and handle the person who has wronged you. The other part of the transaction is the peace, the healing, the restoration, the the, the calm, the resilience, the the long suffering, the the faith that that ev all these different fruits of the spirit that grow inside of you once you go from a place of unforgiveness to forgiveness and you hand it over to God, there is a uh, there's a positive benefit in your life that will grow if cultivated, and so. I always describe things as seeds. And so, yes, you know, if you do something wrong, that's a seed and it will grow into something. Um, when you let go of that weight and you let go of that anger and resentment, see there's some of the words that have come up today. Um, you're sowing a seed. And I, I really love how you described it as sometimes the anger to us means more than the peace. Um, but if you just allow even the possibility that in your mind that you actually could forgive this person, you would see that the reward for forgiving is so much bigger than the pain that you feel right now. Mm -hmm. And I think it's when you're yes. in it, it's hard to see anything bigger than what you're going through. But I would encourage you today, if you are listening um, as someone who, as I said, I find it quite easy to forgive, but I still see the rewards of forgiving. And maybe that's why I do it so easily because I like how it feels to forgive. I don't like to hold grudges with people. I don't like um, to go to sleep angry at somebody or, you know, wondering what they're thinking about me or how I'm going to get them back. I don't like the feeling of that personally. But for you, it may be interfering with your sleep, maybe your eating habits. Maybe you don't go to certain places anymore because of this grudge that you have and it's shrinking your world. Um, forgiveness does the opposite it expands your world it gives you mm -hmm. more grace to see more people to speak more, to more people to to partake in different cultures without judgment it it removes biases it allows you to live more loving and more free mm. and so um, can you touch on you know the healing part you know what does it look like once you've forgiven someone um, and God has taken that weight off you. What's the transformation? That place that we speak about right now, where that person's in that pain still. What's it like on the other side? What does that bigger and better look like? It's a it's a load that's just lifted off your shoulders. It's almost like the Bible describes it a peace that surpasses all understanding. Until you experience it. It's really difficult to put into words, but what I can say is it's almost as if you had a whole bunch of weights on your shoulder and it just got removed and you can stand up straight and walk freely without anxiety, without um, negativity just pouring into your mind, without worry, without hesitance without fear just you're just moving through life with this it's almost like you feel like a like a superpower like you're above everything and unstoppable and it's such a beautiful feeling because it it doesn't mean that nothing ever is going to happen to you again but what it means that is that if it does happen to you it's not going to phase you at the level that it did before such a beautiful place to be. Um, and and I invite every person at the sound of my voice to experience that because God has a way of, and I know it's hard to um, see the reality of that when you're in that pain. I know, trust me. I know it's hard to understand what it is to even experience peace when you've been in the storm and in the desert for so long. But what I can tell you is it is possible. I'm not any special than, than, than you are. 
Steve is not any special than you are. And many other people that you may come across that you've seen have their own story. This story can be yours too. It's available for you as it is for everyone. If you really truly want to experience that peace, that you really truly have to just put it in his hands. However that looks like. If it's throwing yourself on the ground and just crying out to God. If it's just no longer crying to sleep, there's a difference. Crying to sleep, you're going to wake up with that problem in your hands. Crying out to the feet of God and leaving it there. You get up from there and it's no longer yours. It's such a beautiful feeling. And I just pray that anyone who desires to experience that can and will if you truly, truly want it. And, you know, we are going on a beautiful journey here. You know, we've so far, we've spoken about unforgiveness. We've spoken about forgiveness of other people. We've spoken a bit about forgiveness of self. And then we spoke about how does God's forgiveness and human forgiveness coincide. Um, and then now we've just moved on to the healing power of forgiveness. Um, people will hear you and they'll hear me and they'll say, you know, it's easier said than done, you know, and it sounds easy, but maybe it's easy for you because of what you do and who you are. Can you give um, just a snapshot of a piece of your story, just so people, because I know your story, but just so people can see like where you're really coming from and that you're not just throwing these words out here, that you have every right to be angry to, <laughs> you know, and that <laughs> can you just share a portion of your story so they can understand that you are them? I mean, I can tell you that the reason why I am where I'm at is because at one point I did make the choice to allow God to do what he needed to do. But prior to that, I can definitely tell you I was not that person. <laughs> and as I mentioned earlier, um, I've been on the streets since the age of 12. If you think about a 12-year-old, if you have a 12-year-old child, if you have a nephew who's 12, if you've gone to a middle school um, and seen a 12-year-old running around, picture a child at that age who has no knowledge of life as of yet, living on the streets without parents, without direction, without um, uh, a role model to show what life is supposed to look like, what love is supposed to look like, um, what loyalty is supposed to look like. And so you have the, the streets being the teacher. And so... Um, at the age of 12, I didn't, you know, report it as a runaway, um, trying to find my next meal, trying to find where to lay my head. I can tell you that that survival mode, when it kicks in, you do everything and anything to survive. You do anything and everything to make it through just that day. And when you don't know the Lord, it makes it that much more difficult because you have no direction in life. And so you just kind of take it as a roll. You roll with the punches. And so as my journey in life carried on to the age of 13, 14, at the age of 15, I had my first child. Now imagine a 15-year-old having a child with no understanding of what it is to have a mother, yet alone be a mother, um, not understanding what a unit of family looks like, and still on the verge of looking for places to lay your head at. And you continue life. And then at the age of 17, you have another child. And then at the age of 19, you have another child. And so before I even hit my 20s, I was a single mother of three children living the life that was full of disappointments, were, were full of people leaving me, were full of people lying to me, betraying me, uh, infidelity, uh, defamation, not understanding really and truly what emotions felt like, looked like, but just kind of riding the wave of what we call life. And so no interest of knowing God, no understanding who God was, didn't have no church background, right? Obviously, since um, I was out there. And so um, 
I would say I lived a heart not life, right? A lot of people hear that terminology. I, I lived the, the the hood life. I, I understood what it was to um, just be alive. And so I think a lot of people who struggle with their own stories know what it is to just be alive with no meaning or feel like they have no meaning in life, that they're just here to suffer, right? Because when you're going through those types of things, that's what it feels like. You're just here to just suffer. There, there's no outlook. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. There's nothing to look forward to. And even being a mother, there was no instincts that kicked in. I said, oh, I need to change my life now. Because again, I didn't have a, a role model to show what a mother is and what it should look like. And so in, in the, the most important, crucial time of my life, I was spending it looking for something and looking in all the wrong places. Um, my third child, which was my, I mean, yeah, my youngest at the time, um, choked on a jawbreaker. I remember giving him a jawbreaker on his birthday. And this is when I encountered the Lord. Um, there was a nurse that was present who tried to do the Heimlich on my son. I saw him die right before my eyes. Um, I was a strong person in the world. I was affiliated with gangs. I I, I knew, uh, you know, how to walk the streets and people fear me because I was just that person. I was a person who was well respected in the on the streets, and and so I had this sense of uh, of power, and I thought I was this person that people should fear, until I I, I had to give life to my son, which I couldn't. Uh, I, as I saw him lying there dead and I can hear the words from the person who tried to help me um, uh, bring to life and I hear those words, he, I, I, I tried, I couldn't, he's dead, he's dead. I remember feeling, po feeling powerless. I remember in that moment understanding that I was a nobody. I didn't have any power to bring my son back to life. I had the power to do everything else. I just did not have the power to bring my son back to life. The crazier part of the story is that my mom was in the in the picture at this time of my life. Um, and I remember that she was serving the Lord. Look at how God works. She was serving the Lord at this time. Of course, she would try to speak to me about God. I wasn't trying to hear it because you didn't set the example to me. You surely didn't show me what a mom was. So I don't even want to hear about the gospel through your mouth, right? Because this goes back to the conversation of making them uh, the person being the uh, the 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 perpetrator of my pain, right? You're not going to be the healer of my pain for sure. And so I recall my mom standing over my son's body, and um, I wasn't. I was just cursing up a storm. That's all I knew. But God, for some odd reason, I know in the movies when you see like. Uh, crazy things happening around, like everything goes silent, right? Like the, people are screaming and somehow the everything just goes quiet. The voices are still talking or whatnot, but your mind just like filters out all sounds. And I recall my mom, she looked like she was almost floating, which is weird, but it could have been just a scene. I saw her hover right over towards my son's body. And I remember God purposely allowing me to focus in on her mouth. And I remember hearing just the words that came out of her mouth. And she looked up and she said, God, I put him in your hands. She did not even finish that prayer, as simple as it was. She did not even finish saying, in your hands. When that jawbreaker shot out of my son's mouth on its own, mind you, because the nurse had stopped doing the, the Heimlich you know, maneuver, all that stuff. He was only three years old, mind you. He was still a baby, a toddler. The jawbreaker shot out of his mouth. He was black from head to toe because he lost all oxygen out of his body at that point. There must have been like a three, four minute time frame where he had choked already and lost all uh, consciousness. The jawbreaker shot out of his mouth. And then I heard, <laughs> and when I heard the breath of life come into my son's body, and I saw the color come back into his body. And he screamed out my name, mommy. I grabbed my son. I ran outside to the, to, to the front of my mom's front yard. And I threw myself on the ground. And I looked at him to make sure that I wasn't, you know, uh, just seeing things. And he had blood coming out of his nose. And he had blood coming out of his mouth. And 
but he was aw awake and he was alive. And then the ambulance got there. They took us to the hospital. They told me, ma'am, this is a miracle that this child is alive because anyone who chokes on a round object, it's almost impossible for that to come out because it's circular saliva. It just rotates in the throat. It does not come out. You should, this is a miracle. They even called it a miracle. The next day I gave my life to Christ. My son's birthday is 918. I gave my life to Christ 919 of 2003. He had just turned three because that happened on his birthday. And my conversion began in that moment. I told God, I never heard of you. I don't know you, but I know you're real. And because I know you're real, I'm going to serve you from this day on. Whatever it looks like, whatever it takes, I'm going to do it. I used to do all kinds of street drugs, and I used to drink and party and clubbing, and you name it, I did it. I was pierced from the from every part of my body. And little by little, the Lord began to take those things away. And even the areas that I was already, that was part of my life, that was almost secondary, he began to take away to the spirit. He began to just deal with me, and little by little, a little, he just started taking away, tearing away. And it was a gradual process. It wasn't a from one day to another, I'm floating and walking on water. No. He uses me the way he does, and he does it with signs and wonders. He does it with miracles because I was able to witness the miracle. And so no one can tell me that God is not real, you see? And when you have that type of faith, you tell the blind man, open your eyes, and he shall see. You tell that demon to come out of that body, and it shall go. That's that's the, that's the faith that I operate in. That's that's the gospel that I preach. That's the ministry that I that God has, uh, in His mercy, has given me and put in my hands and has trusted me with. But trust me when I tell you, as I mentioned earlier in the podcast, it was four to five years into the ministry. Mind you, God is still using me, but yet I'm still struggling with my unforgiveness. I'm still struggling with the deep parts of who I am because it was a process. It was a lifetime of hurt that God had to prune away little by little because he knows that in order for it to be effective, I had to feel the, the, the pain that came along with the purging. And so because he's a God that's patient, his grace, we spoke about that, it's just his grace is just so expanded to, to deal with us according to the way we are, the way I am, the way I understand life. He was so graceful to work with me on his time and little by little, he began to remove these things away. And as he began to remove these things away, I began to grow deeper and deeper in my understanding. And I was able to feel more freer and freer in who I was. And so Broken to Peace had, had, was birthed from being able to encounter his true forgiveness and his true uh, um, restoration of my heart, not just my life. I gave him my life. I gave my, my life to Christ. I just never turned over my heart. Once I gave him all of me, then he was able to give me all of him. And now I wasn't just being used by God to do powerful things, but now I have a relationship with God that I also can feel him in all the powerful things that he's doing with everyone, including myself. And it's it's that mutual uh, relationship. So trust me when I tell you that I am no different than you. And you are no different than me. We are. We still have our struggles, and we're still growing. And I'm so glad you shared that. I'm so so glad. And I know, I know, we've spoken before. And I just, I just think that sometimes you see public figures, you see people in positions of power, and it can look like it's easy because they are at a certain level, they have a certain income, but. We all go through life, this human experience, we all go through it. And as you've just heard, a very powerful story. Many of you may be able to relate to parts of that story. Maybe you're in that place right now and it seems impossible. But you have an example right here in front of you that it is possible to heal. It is possible to experience that power of forgiveness and not walk in that pain and anger anymore but instead be free and have a story to tell of your own just like maribel today and um thank you so much for sharing that you know such a powerful story um and i'm sure <laughs> your son must really love hearing the story because you know um yes it's how he was saved too you know and yes it was like two for one and it's such a beautiful story. And 
and not just a story it's an opportunity yes and so usually at the end of every chapter I present a person or a few people to my guest um, this person typically is going through a hard time they they are maybe at that point of you know running out of hope running out of answers um feeling anxiety depression you know maybe they struggle with their mental health emotional health maybe they're confused about life maybe they had circumstances similar to yours when you were young maybe they don't have a home maybe they don't have that family structure all the things that you so beautifully articulated um, and I usually ask my guests, you know, what would your advice be for those people? I'm not going to do that today. Um, I'd like to do something a bit different. Um, if you would, I'd like you to pray for those people, for those listeners who uh, may be in that space and they feel that no one understands. Um, or maybe they feel they, they don't have the faith that you have to take that step to begin to, to forgive but they want to deep down have that peace and healing that we spoke of today. Um, would you be so gracious enough to end this chapter today with a prayer? Of course. Yes, Father, I come before your presence knowing and understanding that you are almighty, that you are all powerful, that you are more than able to do all things beyond what we can imagine. Father, I come to you for each person at the sound of my voice, God, you know, you ordained, you created this moment for them, Father God. In your infinite wisdom, you allowed them to hear this in this moment because you had them set up the breakthrough. So right now, Father, in the name of Jesus, I'm praying for the strongholds of the mind, the heart, the body right now, Father God, that any stronghold that is trying to stop this person from growing, from encountering their breakthrough, their healing. Oh, Lord, right now, in the name of Jesus, I declare it broken right now. Father God, I know, I've experienced, I've seen, Lord, your miracles, your breakthrough, your healing power. And Father God, I know that each person that has been suffering as long as they have, they need you, God. They need you. They need you right now. Holy Spirit, I ask right now that, the, that you fill their home, their room, that they can feel your presence, that they can feel your spirit, that they can feel you as I am praying these words, and they can begin to feel the peace that surpasses all, Lord, that you take away this pain, that you take away this broken heart, that you take away this confused mind, God, that you take away these tears, that you take away the negativity, the depression, the thoughts of suicide right now, God, in the name of Jesus. I declare right now and I stand in the gap, God, because I know, Lord, that they need you like I needed you, Father. And so right now I ask God that you go and you penetrate each heart and replace it right now with a new heart, Father God. Do surgery right now. Oh, be their surgeon, God, and remove this broken heart and replace it with a healed one, Lord. Lord, let them feel, God, that you are there, that you have not forsaken them, that you have not left them, that you have been walking side by side throughout their journey of life, God. And this is how they have been able to overcome. It hasn't been with their own strength. It hasn't been with their own knowledge. It hasn't been with their own ways, God, but that you have been directing them even when they didn't know, Father God. I thank you for those closed doors. I thank you, God, when you didn't answer and they thought that you weren't listening and it's because it wasn't their time. Father, I thank you, God, for the no's and I thank you for the yeses because we know that everything in your divine time, God, is just so perfect. So, Father God, I pray that this time is right now for their breakthrough. Let testimonies come out of this call. Let people begin to say that they felt, God, a healing come through their hearts and their lives. God, that whatever the doctors have diagnosed them with, whatever pills they're taking to suppress their pain, that they have to let it go because you are sufficient. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I'm declaring 
powerful stories that are going to come from this broadcast because I know God that everything that you do is not in vain. I know that everything you do comes with results, comes with resolution, Father God. So right now, I thank you for the testimonies. I thank you for the for the stories that are going to manifest. I thank you for the healing. I thank you for the liberation. I thank you for the miracles that are going to happen in this hour because you are God and God alone and only you deserve the glory, Father. Let them understand that God, that without you it is not possible but with you all things are possible that with you god that they can supersede anything that comes in their lives father i thank you for assigning this mountain so that you can teach them that they, that you gave them this mountain so that they can teach others how to move it so that they can teach others that it is possible god that in their story others can be healed and saved as well God, I thank you for all the all the pain that we have endured because we know that it's you developing a story for what you have for the others that don't know how to get out. So we thank you for this divine appointment that you have for us, God. And I'm declaring this in the name of Jesus that it is done. Without any second thought, God, I know it is done. And I thank you and I give you all the glory and all the honor as of now. Amen and amen. Amen, 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 amen. Men, thank you so much. Um, what a beautiful way to conclude today's chapter. Um, I encourage you all to please check out Broken to Peace on social media. You will be inspired. You will be uplifted. You will be educated, empowered, and you will get the truth. You will get the real deal no fluff. Um, thank you, my dear sister, for sharing what you have today. It's such a beautiful conversation. Um, typically, when people speak about forgiveness, you know, it has that energy of like resistance. But today, it just didn't feel that way. It felt very beautiful. And I'm sure many people will be blessed by the information you've shared today, um, your wonderful anointing, your beautiful prayer. And the impact of your own story. So thank you so much for doing this with us today. Of course. I thank you so much for having me. It was an honor, a pleasure, and ah, it was refreshing. Very, very much so refreshing. So thank you for the opportunity to entrust me with your audience. Um, thank you. It was an honor. And here concludes another chapter of the Crown podcast. And what a powerful one. I told you it was a very, very special guest. For more information on my guests, you'll be able to see the links in the show description. Until next time, stay blessed and I wish you better days.